Hi, and welcome to the Big Footy Port Adelaide podcast, the weekly show dedicated to talking all things Port Adelaide. I'm your host, Enviable Tradition, and I'm here once again with my co-host, Macca19. G'day, buddy. How you going, mate? Good, bud. Good. And Fishing Rick 04. Welcome, mate. Yeah, how you going? Good. Real good. It's been a good week for Port again, I think. Uh, you know, not on the results tally, but perhaps, uh, you know, certainly better than previous years when we've gone down to uh, Simmons Stadium or Skilled Stadium or whatever they're choosing to call it nowadays. Uh, but, uh, but unfortunately, you know, two reasonable losses for both of our teams. You know, went down to Geelong at Simmons by 25 points. Uh, could have been a lot worse, but still, you know, certainly not a win. Uh, and then the Maggie's pretty disappointing at Albert and against Centrals and going down by 46 points. So uh, no wins on the board this week, but, you know, hopefully a few other results went our way. It looks like the power at the very least will be heading towards finals. So uh, what did you guys love and hate for the week? Rick, we might start with you, mate. What was your love of the week? Oh, well, my love of the week this, uh, this week, boys, was uh, uh, Matthew Loby. I thought he was uh, fantastic and I had him on best on ground on the weekend. I, I just thought... You know, he was amazing and, you know, some of his stats were, you know, 59 hitouts, uh, 17 touches, five marks. You know, I've been wanting him to take more marks and he's really stood up and done that. Four clearances, six tackles and a goal. You know, I mean, it was a year ago where uh, everyone was questioning where he was at and Sam Jacobs absolutely annihilated him with 62 hit hitouts. And, you know, now he's showing that similar form and, you know, he should be really being uh, made to stand out in the AFL and, you uh, you know, maybe his opposition wasn't the best, but, you know, hats off to him. I've been very impressed over the last six weeks with his play. Third um, third highest hit-out total on record behind Gary Dempsey and Sam Jacobs. Yeah, it's, it's amazing, isn't it? You know, it's, uh, yeah, like I said, who would have thought, you know, it was uh, a year ago. He was touted as, let's dump him and... Now look at him, fantastic. Yeah, it's it's massive numbers, and I've got to say, he's one of the ones I've been on the bandwagon with for a long time. He's, I, mean, I remember seeing him play a couple of those games early on for the Maggies and for West Adelaide as well, where he was just running all over the ground and picking up disposals and, and always playing like a midfielder at times, getting down back and picking up kicks and disposing of it well, and I thought, gee, this guy's got something, and, and you know, it's taken a long time for us to, that to come through and to start seeing some of that potential at AFL level, but, uh, but it's pretty exciting. He's going to be a good player. Rick, what was your hate? Who did do that? <laughs> I know it's it's a good one. I'm I'm pretty sure people will agree with me. It's this um this over the shoulder tackle <laughs> is uh, it's killing me. You know, I mean, if you, I mean, I thought our players were a bit sloppy, and I shouldn't cut into the review, but um, not only that though, but if you lay a good tackle and then the player initiates the high contact by by ducking or lowering their body, which then leads to the tackle going over the shoulders. Look, to me, that should just be play on. And a lot of the contact uh, fairly often is incidental as well. And I'm sure I wouldn't be the only supporter that would uh, suggest that it, this uh, this rule is, uh, you know, just very frustrating and making football very frustrating to watch. Yeah, I think we could have very easily all had uh, that, that exact same hate this week if we chose to too, because I think everyone was pretty annoyed with that this week. And, you know, it just goes to show when even the neutrals are watching the game going, this is ridiculous. Um, you know, then you know that something's going wrong, and uh, and it is. It's frustrating to watch. It's just not football. It just makes a bit of a mockery of the game at times. And uh, yeah, something's got to be done about that rule because at the end of the day, you know, they're, they're saying the head's sacrosanct. We want to protect the head. Yet at the same time, they're rewarding someone who's intentionally creating contact to his head. It kind of defeats the purpose of the rule, I think. No, that's exactly right. Yeah. All right. Over to you, Maka. Your turn, mate. Uh, my love, I don't think I can overlook uh, Angus Monfrey's seven goals. I mean, what a fantastic effort, especially against Geelong um, at Cadinia Park. It's not something that would happen all that often down there. Um, and I think it's just fantastic reward for, for a great season by Angus Monfrey's um, to kick those seven goals. Um, yeah. he, he's been a fine pickup, a, a really good pickup. Um, yeah, a really clever pick uh, as a free agent. Um, uh, there were some queries about his sort of clutch goal kicking early on in the season. Um, I think he's he's uh, resolved them, um, and his last you know seven or eight weeks have been really really good, really consistent. Yeah, his uh, his goal kicking's definitely improved, and uh, I think it was David Hale was the last person to do that down at Canadian Park. Yeah, so right. yeah. hopefully uh, hopefully it's not a similar sort of flash in the pan seven goal effort. Hopefully there's more to come. <laughs> 
<laughs> Hopefully he keeps his hair as well. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so my love for the week was uh, just the fact that we're, we've gotten ourselves into the position now where we're pretty unhappy with a 25-point loss to Geelong at Kidinia Park. Um, you know, I think it's a fair sign of where we've come, where we're thinking, look, that's just not good enough. You know, we can do better than that. And, uh, and we want to be pushing ourselves against all teams at all venues. Um, and I think that's a sign of where we're at now as a club. Whereas, you know, previous years, I think we would have thought, hey, 25 points to Geelong at Kidinia Park, you know, we'd take that. Uh, now we're thinking, yeah, it's all right, but gee, we can do better. And uh, you know, next time we go there, we're going to expect to do better, and hopefully, we'll do better. So, I, I love that. I love that sign of you know the change of what's going on at the club and the expectations lifting, um, and hopefully, the players lifting to meet that as well. Um, my hate for the week is the possibility that that the ninth place team might get into the finals. I just think, I just think that's silly. I, I just think uh, you know you got to earn your finals. And if it was Port and we finished ninth, I don't know that I'd want to sneak into the finals in a ninth spot because the Bombers have been knocked out. Uh, particularly, I think because now we've got Sando out there in the media saying that maybe Adelaide will get that ninth spot. You think, oh come on, can't we just knock them out and not have to listen to the rubbish in the media? Anyway, um, so that's my hope for the week: is, is the ninth spot getting a gig in the finals? And I hope it doesn't happen. I hope I hope the uh, I hope Essendon stay in there, and actually, I hope we get to play the Bombers in their first final because I reckon they might be cooked, and I reckon we might be a good chance. So. Let's move on. Uh, Port obviously played Geelong on Saturday at Simmons Stadium, lost by 25 points after being down at one stage by around 60 points. Uh, Rick, you're the uh, first cab off the rag to give us a nice detailed review here, mate. So tell us what you thought of the game. Uh, disappointed. I was really disappointed. And I think one of our hosts uh, before the before the game uh, actually said that they thought Port Adelaide would win. Is that right, Macca? Yeah, I thought we'd get up. I think yeah. you both tipped him last week, didn't you? you? Didn't you both tip us last week? Oh no, that was uh, that no, was Donny. That was Don Draper. That was, that's yeah, right. Yeah. All right. That was Don. Yeah, I I was away work, <laughs> um, but uh, yeah. So, well, it was really disappointing, as as we all know, and and as you said too. I mean, it's good that our expectations are increasing uh, with how we expect the boys to play. Um, I guess I want to shout out to. Um, I'm pretty sure the the handles handy Andy um, on Big Footy his I was reading the review thread from from Macker, and basically all the points that he he highlighted in his review was exactly the stuff that I was going to talk about uh, tonight. So he must be pretty smart if he can. He's thinking the same as me. Anyway, that's my that's my joke for the night. Um, but uh, look, it was a disappointing start. Let's face the facts. We we let away let Geelong get away with it too early. I didn't. I don't think we set up structurally too well. Um, I was concerned all week about uh, our movement if we were to be um, allowing John Geelong excess numbers behind the ball and free run. We've had games uh, recently against the Crows and Essendon where um, you know there's been patches where we've just let the players behind the ball run through our defence too easily. And again, I was just worried um, that was going to happen. And, and Geelong's too good a side that we can allow that sort of transition to occur with. And we played really uh, excessively into their hands. Um, because of our lack of run from the defensive 50 especially, um, we were kicking to the wing. And, uh, and then from that, from that position, it was stagnant. And Geelong was setting up with their extra numbers, getting the ball, sweeping, and then running through with numbers uh, and exposing our defence. And... It was probably very hard for our our defenders to really um, man up and, and do too much. Um, again, as I said in the in the hate, um, the giving away of free kicks. Uh, some of them were poor, some of them were unlucky. Uh, but again, that really hurt the momentum. We set up well from the from the clearances. We were winning the clearances, but it, as we know with Geelong, that doesn't really necessarily uh, matter and influence their game plan because they quite often lose the clearances, but they're able to come through and still dominate uh, the game on transition, which is exactly what happened to us. Uh, I thought um, I've been really critical of Robbie Gray this this year. In the last couple of games, I thought he's really stood up and he's he's been very clean with his with his ball movement and his handling. Um, as I highlighted earlier, um, Matt Lobie, fantastic. I had him best on ground. I know that's hard on uh, on Angus Mumphreys uh, considering his seven goals, but. I thought the effort that he played on for the whole game uh, was just fantastic, and you know you just can't you can't really be so happy for a person or proud of a person really for the turnaround. I mean, a lot of supporters had a bit of faith. Um, I'm really worried about our forward structure as well. Again, against Geelong, 
uh, we were exposed. Um, our tall forwards especially, uh, I think, I'm sorry, boys, I, I left my notes at the office. I said that earlier, but, um, you know, I think we only kicked two go- three goals from our key forwards this week. The week before, it was only a couple of goals. Um, you know, I don't know if it's if it's the coaching and the strategy or, or if our key forwards just aren't running into the right spots. But, you know, with three key forwards in Westhoff, Schultz and, and Butcher, you'd be hoping uh, for more output in our forward line from those boys and, and making a greater impact in the game. And, and obviously, I'm not concerned about uh, John Butcher's long-term standing in the game. You know, he's still young and he's coming back from injuries and, and interrupted pre-season. But... Honestly, we have to uh, we have to question where we're actually going as a team this year with him in the side when he's really struggling to make an impact. And it's great to be running and chasing and, and putting some de- defensive pressure on, but we still need some offensive pressure from John as well. And I think Gary Hocking uh, uh, brought that up earlier uh, before the game as well, that we need to turn that around. Um, you know, the midfield has racked up good numbers in the end. Uh, you know, but I think it's uh, it was an easy game to sort of pad up the numbers at, at the end there. You know, Geelong's intensity dropped off a little bit, uh, our intensity picked up, and obviously the midfielders still were able to get a lot of ball. But obviously, I probably wouldn't. I would have had uh, not many in the in the top players uh, because when the game was there uh, to be won and stood up for, uh, our mids probably were a bit disappointing other than uh, Brad Ebert, which I thought really turned it around from the previous week where I thought he was quite poor and he was a lot better and cleaner with his ball handling this week. So overall, disappointed. Come away with a 25-point loss. Could be a lot worse, so at least we fought it out. And it has been Geelong. You know, not many teams have won there. And uh, hopefully next year, stronger bodies, stronger side, uh, will do a lot better. Yeah, can't disagree with much of what you've said there, Rick. Um, it was a really, really disappointing first half, and it, and it was something that I mentioned in the podcast last week was that I, I really wanted us to be accountable in our own forward line. We, I didn't want us to allow Geelong to have that plus one across the half back line. Um, we let them do that, and Mackey just dominated. Like he mopped up so much of our forward entries. Um, Enright as well, I mean, both of them picked up huge numbers. I think Enright had 27 and, and Mackie had 26 disposals. Um, and, and you just can't allow that. I mean, you just play right into Geelong's hands and how they want to play that game because they love to throw an extra man back. Um, they almost throw an extra man forward as well and, and deliberately have less numbers through the midfield because they know that with their midfielders, they're super quick. So if they get their hands on the ball... They're just going to run it out with their quick handball. They play corridor football. Um, and it, it's very hard to stop that once they're moving. Um, and a lot of those really quick players um, dominated. Like Stephen Motlop probably had his, the best game of his career. Stevie Johnson had a had a fantastic game. Christensen and Stokes played really well as well. Um, and we just got bossed by them in that first half. It, it was pretty disappointing, especially... I mean, I did think that if we... You know, if we were accountable, we had a shot at winning. So it was pretty disappointing um, on that aspect. I thought, yeah, you know, in the second half we really showed um, some pretty decent signs to kick 12 goals in a half a footy at Cadinia Park. I, I think that's a pretty good effort, um, especially with our midfield. Our midfielders got back into the game a bit. Um, I do agree with your concerns about the forward line. Um, I mean, with Schultz playing further up the ground, I think that's adding a new dimension to his game. Um, I think we're losing something closer to, to goal, though. Um, and I, spe- I think if, if Schultz is going to play that uh, sort of almost Chad Corns 2001-style game plan, um, we really need Butcher to, to get, you know, get some marks and kick some goals, and it's just not happening at the moment. Um, but there was something that... Um, I wanted to mention one of the old-time posters, Port01, um, had this to say, and I, I thought it was a, a really clever post. Um, and he said, just for a bit of statistical clarity, uh, the 104 points Port kicked was the first time a side has reached 100 points at Kidinia Park since our win there in 2007. Um, the four other clubs that play there this year scored 71, 44, 30 and 36. Uh, the 29 scoring shots the Cats had was their lowest at Kidinia Park this year. Their inside 50s was 12 lower than any other game at Cadinia Park this year and only two off their lowest for the season. Um, and ours were 10 higher than any other team at Cadinia Park this year as well. So I think that shows that, you know, whilst disappointing overall, 
there are some really good signs for the future. Um, to try and match, you know, a team which has really dominated us for such a long time now. There's some good stats there, Maka. I'm quite impressed with those. And there was one other thing I noticed in the game as well. And, and uh, you know, there was a big emphasis pre-game about um, Geelong, you know, you've got to use the corridor there. And the thing I noticed, we seemed to rush to get to the corridor as quickly as possible, which I think made the game style a little bit predictable and made it easier for Geelong to set up. And what I noticed uh, quite often, and it'd be interesting if anyone else noticed that, was um, with Geelong style, they didn't rush to the, to the centre corridor instantly, but on a lot of occasions... They play to the wing, but when they got to about 80 metres out, you could see that they were transitioning to get to the middle of the corridor by that 80 metre mark. So then they had the diversity of choice in relation to getting into the forward 50, where, whereas we tried to get in bang from the defensive 50 into the corridor, which was predictable and allowed them to sort of uh, man up and try and block our run. Yeah, and I, that's what I thought of the game as well. I thought uh, it really seemed like Geelong had gone in with a really deliberate ploy to try and play some more uncontested footy. Um, obviously, they're a pretty skillful side. As you said, they've got some quick players through there now. Uh, you know, it's only a couple of years ago everyone was talking about Geelong being too slow, even though they were winning a bunch of games. But now, obviously, got some real quick players there. And, and I thought that's where they beat us. That they, were, they were just too classy and too skillful for us on the outside. Um, and I think we just didn't, in that first half, we just didn't bring enough intensity there to really put them under the pressure. And as soon as they got the ball out from that contested situation, they just, they just tore us to shreds. I thought their, their skill was, was very high, uh, and they are a very good team. And so I thought that, that the game was lost on the inside, where we really needed to be a lot better defensively, a lot harder at it, a lot better at getting first hand on the ball. Uh, to stop them from getting the ball outside and sort of playing the game on their terms. And I think that fits in with some of the stats Maka shared with us. It just, just shows that, you know, they were playing perhaps a slightly different game style to what they have at other times this year. And they were getting that ball on the outside and running it, uh, leading to a higher scoring game. Um, and I thought that showed in the second half as well that, you know, as we did start coming back into it, you know, we were kicking a lot of goals. We were, you know, our midfielders were getting a lot of possession. Uh, but I thought it wasn't necessarily the fact that we were, you know, getting a, winning a lot of the ball, but more so that Geelong was playing this uncontested style and, and allowing us some space to, to rack up the numbers, uh, even though they were sort of still well on top. Yeah, there was a, a, another interesting statistic that I want to bring up, and, it, and I think it shows where um, sort of we got lost in translation a bit. Um, we won the hit out 64 to 28. I mean, that is an absolute thrashing. I know Loby was mm. playing against two pretty junior ruckman but even though i mean that's you know almost triple uh, the hit outs uh, we also won the clearances 43 to 30 but we actually lost the inside 50s um so we're getting first hands on the ball we're winning the hit outs we were winning the clearances but i just don't think our skill level's up to it um to play these elite teams at the moment yeah it certainly i thought there was a big difference there in the skill level and just they, they just class you know they, they just looked the class above um, and we didn't seem to respond very well to that extra pressure that comes from playing a top team. You know, we, we just, uh, you know, and perhaps it wasn't even responding. Perhaps we were not just at that level yet, but, uh, but there was definitely a difference in class there and just shows, you know, where we've got to get to in the next couple of years if we really want to be a, you know, legitimate finals contender. Um, so let's, let's go on and have a look at our best players, guys. Who'd you have? Uh, well, Rick, we'll start with you, mate. Who'd you have as your best players? Uh, well, obviously, I had uh, Matt Loby as uh, best on ground, which is, he was only just shading Angus Mumphreys. I mean, seven goals, uh, you know, uh, as you pointed out earlier, was, and for Geelong was a, an amazing effort. So, I mean, he could quite easily have those uh, flipped around. Um, I had, uh, trying to think now, who was the other one? I had uh, Ch- Jasper Pittard in there. I know it's a little bit controversial, but uh, I thought his run was fantastic. And, and that's what we were severely lacking uh, we need that dash, and uh, he was my young player, actually, of the game. And uh, and Robbie Gray, as I said earlier, I think his uh, his c- contested work around the pack is just getting fantastic. Um, you know, he's he's going to be a great player uh, for us next year, and uh, hopefully we don't follow uh, some of the forum uh, suggestions. I, I can't remember who brought it up, but um, hopefully we don't trade him for uh, Jonathan Patton. <laughs> And who'd you have there, Mecca? 
Uh, obviously, Gus Monfries, seven goals, best on ground, fantastic performance. Uh, Matty Loby was my next best player. Um, not just his hitouts, but his, uh, his play around the ground I was really impressed with. Kicked a goal as well. Um, Robbie Gray, I had his third best. Um, his, his last four or five weeks have really been good. Um, really impressed with his game. Um, Sammy Cahoon, um, really glad he's been kept in the side. Um, to go down there against a, a match-hardened elite team like that and play as well as he did... Um, he only made one or two small errors. Um, you know, he, I was really impressed with the way that he hits the target. You know, he, he backs himself in, and he kicked a nice goal as well. Um, and I thought Brad Ebert played a really good game, especially in the first half when um, we were getting absolutely smacked. I thought he was um, the one leader that was really standing up, trying to stop that from happening. Yeah, and, and I'm pretty much agreeing with all of you, actually. I, I had Lobby as the best player. Uh, once again, it's pretty tough when you get kick seven goals and don't get POG, but um, I thought I thought Lobby, I, that was just a fantastic performance, and, and probably as much as anything, it's just that level of excitement that, hey, you know, we've got a Ruckman here who's coming good, and, uh, and you know, a young player coming through. Um, you know, I thought pretty exciting to see that, and so, to see what he started to become as a Ruckman is going to stand us in good stead for a, a lot of years to come, I think. Um, obviously, Gus in second, uh, yeah, seven goals. You can't knock that. And and I had Robbie Gray in my top three as well. And I think that's fantastic. That's really brilliantly done by Robbie to come back from the injury he's had to be playing that sort of footy at this stage of his recovery. You know, most people will tell you not to expect anything until next year. Uh, coming back from that sort of injury, so uh, he's done a great job by all accounts. He's got it pretty hard into his rehab and has really, uh, you know, done all the work. And, and he's starting to get some of the rewards. And, and as everyone said, I think what we see from Robbie next year, I think, is going to be uh, some pretty special stuff. So um, I might move on and move straight into the best young players, which I'll get you guys to follow on as well. And I actually had Lobby as my my best best young player as well. I thought, uh, you know, he's not as young as he used to be anymore, Lobby, but I thought, you know, as far as Ruckman go, he's still a pretty young guy. He's still learning his craft, and uh, and he just had a great game. Uh, as you guys mentioned, young Colhoun, uh, it was just a fantastic game. Gee, I'm really excited about what we're seeing from him. I thought his composure under pressure against some of those big Geelong bodies, um, and he wasn't scared to take him on. You know, he'd take him on, he'd duck and dive around him, he'd dispose the ball well, he used the ball. I'm not sure what his efficiency was, but it was right up there. And uh, some really neat little kicks and disposal I thought was really exciting to see. And, uh, and I had Jasper Pittard in there as well. I think, uh, I think he's been very unfairly criticised by some of the Port fans at the moment. And uh, we might touch on that a little bit later. But I thought his dash and his run and you know, his willingness to take the game on I thought was exceptional. And, uh, and the more he does that, the better he's going to get at it. And so uh, I, you know, I'm very encouraging of Jasper to keep taking the game on and you know, it's that little bit of X factor you need to get in the modern game, to get through the zone, to get out the back, to you know, to split teams open and to make other teams really think about what you're about. So, uh, Rick, who do you have for the young guys, mate? Yeah, I had um, Jasper, Jasper Pittard as uh, my main man. Um, honestly, yeah, I'm, I agree. Just just his run and his carry, uh, I think, for our team is vital and. Uh, you know, talk of maybe dropping him is just outlandish and crazy. I mean, obviously he's still young and still raw, and we just gotta we gotta put up and handle that. And I thought it was fantastic. And he's not young, but I want to throw him in because I forgot to mention it earlier. Is uh, I actually thought Dom Cassisi's first half was uh, uh, was fantastic. You know, the the young fella. You know, he's just getting better with age and. Uh, you know, but and I, it's interesting. I reckon his body shape's changed a little bit. He looks a lot, um, a lot bigger. But um, yeah, no. But I, I thought his first half when we were under pressure, except for when he got burnt off by Shannon Motlop, was good. But hats off to Jasper this week. Yeah, I had Sammy Cahoon as my best young player. Um, I want to mention Nathan Blee for his uh, first game this year. I uh, thought he did a really good job. You know, he had a couple of goals kicked on him, but I was really impressed with his hands in tight. Um, he used the ball well. He was quite creative off that. Um, back flank there and I, I still think he's got a big future ahead of him Beautiful and so uh, moving on to the SNFL and the Maggies playing centrals at Albert and Macca there's probably not a lot that needs to be said about that 46 point loss but do you want to uh, give us a little bit Not, not, not much more to add. Uh, I think um, Central's won 21-12 to 13 goals, 14. Um, it was a bit of a tricky game with the wind. There was a big breeze blowing to one end of the ground. Um, we we're pretty even um, at half time. I think there was only two points in it. Then Central's came out and went bang in the third quarter, kicked seven goals to nil. 
Um, I guess there was a slight, slight hope that we would come back in the last quarter um, and try and um, match what Central did in that third, but it just didn't happen. Um, I don't think we were disgraced at all. I thought we, we really played it out to the end. Um, we just weren't good enough um, in the end. It was good to see some different players um, getting in the best and, and getting a bit bit of the ball. Um, Luke Slattery was our best. He had 20 disposals and 11 marks. Uh, Stevie Summon had a, had a really good game as well. He had 26 disposals. Um, Corey Beard, he um, took nine marks and kicked two goals. And Aaron Young had 20, uh, 20 touches. Beautiful. All right, so Rick, maybe you can jump in, mate, and talk about some of the other SNFL power players. Uh, what did you like the look of this week, mate? Well, I thought um, Jakey Need. Uh, you know, to be honest, I was a bit worried uh, after being rested in italic brackets from Port, uh, and I thought he was going to come straight back in, but they did put him in SA NFL, uh, sticking up uh, 16 posies and, uh, you know, having a bit of an influence uh, statistically in the game. Uh, I thought it was a promising side because, uh, Simon, we've had players in the past come in the AFL and then drop straight back to the SA NFL and then disappear in the in the two. So, uh you know, it was good to see that uh, a young fellow like him can can go back into uh, our reserves team. I'm oh, sorry, I'm not allowed to say that, am I? Uh, the Port <laughs> Magpies, and uh, and still uh, stack up some reasonable numbers. Uh, and I'm just reading the uh, the SA NFL bit at the moment as well. And you know, I noticed that they they made reference to Nick Salter uh, possibly getting some more midfield time and. He had a bit of an influence in the Eagles game and that's good to see. And I know there's a lot of us out there that would still hold out a dream and hope that maybe he can uh, get a run up forward and maybe he might be the potential replacement for uh, uh, John Butcher this week if John's uh, given a rest. Yeah, I, I titled my uh, SNFL Power Play Review The Forgotten Men this week because I thought uh, you know three of, the players, three of the guys who got in the best players this week were Young, Heath and Salter. And, uh, and three players who just seem to, for whatever reason, have been you know, out of the side and, and not getting much of a look in, particularly Heath, who I thought was pretty darn good earlier on in the year, has been pretty unlucky not to be getting another gig. Um, and obviously Young, you know, Salter with his injuries, and Young sort of just hasn't been the same player for whatever reason this year, but it's good to, really good to see those three coming up and getting in the best players. And once again, it's just showing that extra depth that we've got this year, um, which, which is really important for a side, and particularly a side heading towards the finals. It's good to know that if you know someone does go down, if something you know, untoward happens, that we've got those players there ready to jump on in. So um, what did you like to look of, Maka? Yeah, Young as well. I mean, this is his third really good week in a row um, for the Maggies. He had 20 touches. Um, six clearances and four inside fifties, um, which was pretty impressive. Um, and my other favourite player was probably Daniel Stewart, uh, the real forgotten man. Um, he's played one AFL game this year, um, went straight back out of the side, and he kicked three goals this week. Um, so he might be a chance to come back in for Butcher as well. Nice. All right. So we've already spoken about this player a little bit, but we thought it seems though there was a big thread on the uh, Port Adelaide Big Footy board this week discussing Jasper Pittard and where he's at, that we might have a little bit of a chat about him this week. Um, Ricky and I have already spoken about it a little bit, so we might let you jump in first, Macca. What are your thoughts on Jasper and where he's at? I think my thoughts on Jasper are pretty well known in that I don't think he's a defender at all. Um, I, I pretty much hate him down in defence, but I really think he's got a big future on the wing. I don't understand why we don't put him on a wing and let him run and create and kick inside 50. Um, I think with his body shape um, and where he's at in his development at the moment, um, I think he gets pushed off the ball too easy. I think he often overcommits to one-on-one contests and falls over um, or overruns the ball. Um, He tends to lose his man a lot. Um, He can't break a tackle uh, deep in defence. Um, but every time we've thrown him a little bit further of the play um, this year, he's really impressed. Um, he had a great game against St Kilda um, playing on a wing. Um, and again, in the third quarter this week, I thought he had a ripper game on a wing. Um, you know, kicking inside 50 and getting a few goal assists. He had three goal assists this week, which is um, which is pretty good. Yeah, it's tough love there, Mac. Here I, um, I must have Pittard goggles on because I don't see a lot of that, <laughs> that what you're talking about. I am... Um... I know it's, it sounds like to me if I wasn't if I didn't hear the name I thought you would have been describing uh, Lewis Stevenson from earlier in the year. That's exactly how I saw him playing defence. So, I mean, yeah, I understand. Very similar, very similar player. Yeah, yeah but I, I haven't noticed Jasper um, uh, losing his opponents in defence and and uh, and the weakness in body. I thought he's uh, I thought he's been uh, relatively strong in in defence uh, for us this year. And and as we've highlighted the run, but uh, at the same time I can also 
see your point about playing him on the wing because, uh, you know, we need that speed, especially now that we've lost Daniel Pierce this year. Um, you know, we're lacking a bit of that leg speed and he's providing that for us and that's fantastic. But I guess we need it off the half-back flank and I'd hope, you know, how many games has he played now? 20 games in the mid-20s? You know, maybe with the, another pre-season and a stronger body, he'll be able to break those plays. But the, the one thing, I guess, was a lot of people were criticising when he came back mid-season. His disposing, disposal efficiency was uh, woeful, apparently. But, you know, I haven't really noticed it in the last last uh, few weeks or last four weeks, especially. I think, I think his disposal has been quite good. Yeah, I, I've got to say, I'm with you, Rick. Like, I, I really think, I've actually really liked the way that Jasper's committed himself defensively. I think, you know, he do, he has a real crack. He, you know, he has a go when the ball's there in the air. He's not afraid to jump up at it. And, you know, I thought he had a couple of really crucial spoils on the weekend where he really attacked the ball as a third man up and fisted the ball away. And uh, and I think, as you said, I think his attacking side of his game obviously is his strength with that run and carry. Uh, but I think he's been doing enough defensively to, to keep his spot there. And I think he's the kind of young player that we really need to keep giving a go. And I think the more he plays back in defence, the more chances he gets to do that, then the better he's going to get at that defensive side of his game, the better he's going to get at his decision-making of when to run and when to carry and you know when to use the ball. And uh, I think he's the sort of player we've just got to leave there and he's going to get better and better at it. I think he's got a good head on his shoulders. He has a genuine crack. He's certainly got some skills there. Um, I, I just think leave him on the half-back flank and I think he's going to get better and better. Not Maybe he's a... I'm not maybe he's maybe he's a victim too of our disposal efficiency, because I mean I think what well, we're the worst in the league or right down there, and so uh, when he is running forward and trying to be attacking and we're coughing up the ball, he's getting exposed a little bit more. Yeah, and I think that comes with the role as well. I think you know that that attacking half back flanker has been a pretty uh, a pretty strong whipping boy for the Port Adelaide fans over the years. And uh, I think it's, as much as anything, I think it does sometimes come down to a bit of an understanding of that role, that if you are going to be attacking off of the half-back flank, then sometimes you are going to get caught out. And that's just, a, that's just the nature of the beast when you're playing that role. You know, you can't be running down the ground and then expect to be back, with, you know, if the ball's suddenly turned over as well. Um, and to a certain degree, that comes down to that team defence as well, where, you know, if one player is running off and creating, then it is up to the other defenders to be able to slide in behind him and, and cover that too. And so, um, yeah, but look, I, from what I've seen in his, his one-on-one stuff, I think he's had a genuine crack. And like I said, I'd, I'd leave him there. I reckon he's going to come good. There's no doubt he has a genuine crack. I just don't think he's... Um, I guess it'll come in time, but I don't think he's strong enough physically to, to handle one-on-one contests in the, in the defensive 50. Um, and I think he loses his man too much. Um, and I think with the way that we've played this year, we've thrown um, Broadbent back in defence, we're, we're now playing O'Shea in defence um, both those guys do the run and carry thing a lot better than Pittard does, in my opinion um, so what I would like to see is leave those two players in defence move Pittard onto a wing um, get him creating and running I mean that run he did on the wing uh, on the outer wing um, in the third quarter which set up a goal to Cahoon I mean that was fantastic and, th- and that's what I really want to see from him Um you know, I think our midfield's pretty one pace at the moment. Uh, I think that's something that we really need to look at in the off season is bringing in some more pace. Um, but maybe we can do that internally, and, and I think Pittard's the perfect player for that sort of role. All right. Well, I think we'd have to agree to disagree on Pittard and his defensive <laughs> capabilities, and we might have to move on. So, uh, Maka, do you want to start us off with a bit of a preview as to uh, this week against Gold Coast and what you expect? Look, I think it's another danger game. I mean, it's a must-win game for us. If we win, um, then we're in. Simple as that. Um, I don't think there's any excuses for us to lose this week. Um, Gold Coast are, are looking pretty bare bones at the moment. I mean, they're going to lose Bock. I think Day's not going to play with a hamstring injury. Um, Sexton's done his shoulder. Brown's out for four weeks now um, in suspension. Um it's looking likely that they won't have Nichols or, or Richatelli or Hunt or Warnock again. Um, Gary Ablett's under a bit of a cloud. He hasn't been at his best for a couple of weeks now. Um, so, I mean, that's that's a lot of experience and a lot of their better players that are that are either out of the side or, or under a bit of a cloud. Um, I think this is another quick team that we've got to be wary of. Um, they've got a lot of uh, pacey players. Um, 
uh, uh, something that we seem to struggle with. Um, not just the elite teams like Hawthorne and Geelong, but also I think Richmond and uh, Western Bulldogs earlier this year uh, really tore us to pieces with their pace. So that's something we've got to be a bit careful of. Uh, we've got to make sure we win the ball first. I think um, Lobie can, can beat their rucks. Um, I think he'll be playing against Gorringe, which will be interesting. Um, and you look at uh, a couple of stats, um, which I think will be telling, is that we're um, in, in a bit of a comparison with our for and against for each game this year. We're plus 11 with disposal, so we're winning more of the ball than our opponents are on a regular basis. And Gold Coast are negative 15, so they're, they're going the opposite way. Uh, and the same story in the inside 50s. Um, we're plus 5 and they're minus 4. So I think they're two stats that really could um, get it, go in our favour. And if we get it inside 50 enough, we're going to kick the goals and we're going to win the game. Simple as that. Um, it's really about uh, finding the key forwards to kick us a winning goal, uh, a winning uh, score this week, I think. Um, I'd love to see Butcher... I mean, that, that's the real question, um, is what do we do with Johnny Butcher, really? I mean, do we keep him in? Do we drop him? Um, is it his confidence? Um, is it his body? You just don't know. Um, we really need a key forward to, to stand up and kick four or five this week, I think. Um, and and if we if we stop guys like Prestia, McKenzie, Swallow and Harbrow um, and Ablett, um, even though he's under a bit of a cloud, I think we'll win the game um, pretty comfortably. Well, you have to keep John Butcher in this week, surely, don't you? I know, I, I know. I kept, I had him as an out for Tom Jonas um, in the ins and outs thread, but you know, now that you've uh, brought that up with the injuries that uh, uh, Gold Coast have got as well, it's a perfect opportunity for him to get a bit of confidence. Well, I guess it's the thing is, I mean, or well, that's that's the thing is it confidence or is it his body? I mean, he's literally had only one kick in the last two games, which, I mean, we all want to back him in, but. At some point, you've got to think, well, how long do you back him in for? Um, and you really got to see some sort of output coming from him. Is that yeah. our delivery to the forward line as well, though? I mean, I'm not sure if we're really playing a forward structure where we're, we're actually trying to facilitate the, the key forwards uh, dominating the game. Yeah, personally, I think it's his confidence. I think his confidence is shot... And I think he could probably do with a week or two at SANFL level, whether that's this week or next week, I'm not too sure. But you look at how he's playing, um, he doesn't really lead much. He does these sort of half-hearted leads and doesn't think he can win the bowl. Um, he, he can't sort of outbody his opponent too much. Um, yeah, I'm just not sure. It's the real query of the week, this one. Yeah, and I think you're right, Macker. I think it's definitely confidence with him. Like, I'm a, I'm a big fan of Butcher and a big supporter of his, but obviously his confidence is down. I mean, you can't blame delivery when the bloke's dropping sort of bread and butter chest marks, which he has done a few times in recent weeks. So, um, you know, you can't necessarily blame that entirely on uh, delivery. Uh, having said that, I think he should definitely stay in this week. I think, um, you know, this is a must-win game for us. If we're serious about not just making up the numbers, but actually, you know, doing something in the finals, then we really need to win and win well this week particularly with all those players out from the Gold Coast. And my sort of notes I made for this week was I think that, you know, given this being the game it is, and with Gold Coast having so many players out and being such a young team, you know, who tend to fade towards the end of the year, particularly when those senior players are out, it's really a game that we want to win and win well. Um, and I think if we're really going to, you know, challenge teams in finals, then we need to get some of our more sort of X-factor players into really good form. You know, I think Robbie Gray was one who started to hit some form against Geelong. And, uh, and you'd really like to see that carry on. I think Johnny Butch is another one of those where if he can actually fire and start kicking us a couple of goals, then it's, it's going to make a massive difference to our team. Um, Hartlett's another one who's been playing pretty well, uh, but I think can go to another gear. He's, he's got another, another level there in him that, that if, if he can find that, we can be a real serious sort of finals player. Um, Westhoff's a bit the same. I think he's had a very good year, uh, but he's perhaps just been a little bit quieter over the last couple of weeks. And... Uh, I think, you know, if he, if he can really start busting games open like he was earlier on in the year, um, then, then, you know, we're going to be pretty hard to beat in a finals game. Um, and my other one is Jasper Pittard. Again, once again, I'm a bit of a fan of his. And, and I think if he can just continue to develop as he has been and, and perhaps, uh, you know, clean up his disposal a little bit, get that little bit more confidence going there, um, he can be a real X factor for us in the finals as well. He's that sort of player that can really cut through, you know, a tough, tight finals game. Um, you know, get that run and carry happening, get over the back of the zone and really bust the game apart. And so I think for us, getting those sort of X-factor players into really good form this week against the Gold Coast, I think we've got a really good opportunity to do that. 
Um, and hopefully that means we can hit the, hit the finals running and, and have a bit of an impact. Yeah, spot on, mate. And uh, I've got to say, one thing I'm glad about is we're playing a bottom eight side and uh, thank God it's not their grand final because I'm absolutely <laughs> sick and tired of playing these bottom eight sides where it's their grand final for the finals. And I think if we win this week, and I'm, I'm pretty confident now with uh, the Let's way they're tip, tracking. Macca. Jump in with a tip, mate. Let's go. What do you reckon? Oh, Port by 47 points. Nice. Rick, what do you think, mate? Yeah, I'm going Port, and I, I think quite comfortably. Let's go five goals. Nice. So we're all bit, pretty similar page again this week. I've got Port by 33 points this week. So uh, hopefully we're all right, and we get a, a win around that sort of 30 to 40 point mark, and we'll all be happy on the podcast next week. So thanks again, guys, for a great show this week. Hopefully everyone's enjoying it. We look forward to seeing all your feedback on the Big Footy Port Adelaide Forum. And uh, until next week, go the power. Have a good Cheers, one. Guys. Look at that. There it is. It's all over. Port Adelaide. They had the power to win. And it was very much history in the making today.